Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining. We, we will be starting at, at 11 a.m. So thank you to those who've already joined us. Sorry, Mary, I'm trying to share the presentation.
Hello everyone. It's 11 o'clock, so I will make a start with the introductions to this open disclosure webinar. So Angela has kindly and generously handed over the baton for me to do the introductions. She will be speaking today on the implementation of open disclosure. So I will just uh, give you a brief introduction. Uh, we will be starting in a few minutes. Please uh, do engage uh, with the webinar. You will all be muted to say at, at the outset, um, but do engage in the chat and let us know where you're dialing in from. It's, it's always quite encouraging to see uh, uh, the vast spread of participants that we have uh, attending and dialing in. So when you join the webinar, you can listen to the webinar and um, you will be able to dial in if you're having connections pro connection problems. Um, we will put the details in the chat as well um, of how you can dial in. The telephone number is there and the access code that you have to use. Um, please take a moment to introduce yourself, as I said, um, through the chat. As you know, the open disclosure webinars are credited with CPD points, which you will receive. Um, you have to obviously dial into the webinar to receive those CPD points and they follow after the session. And a certificate can also be provided for any person who's attending and may not be availing of the um, CPD points. So we're very fortunate again for um, the generosity of a number of our presenters who are supporting us in the webinar. Um, it is an important webinar, as a lot of you will know, it is Open Disclosure themed week. Um, the webinar is focusing on implementation of Open Disclosure nationally. So through many avenues and forums, we are promoting Open Disclosure. Um, we do that as a matter of course in any way, but, but this week we, we are really highlighting the importance of open disclosure again. Um, in Ireland and internationally, we have come a long way in terms of open disclosure. And nationally, that is uh, not least down to the work of the National Open Disclosure Office, so by Angela, Mary, Catherine, Kelly and Sandra. And we're fortunate for Angela giving us an insight into all the work that they have done in terms of implementation. As well as leading out on policy development and training, it is crucial that implementation is supported locally by winning the hearts and minds of colleagues who will be carrying out open disclosure. Uh, we will hear from some wonderful colleagues today who have uh, championed implementation within their organisation. That's Moya Wilson, the Quality and Risk Manager for Cl Sligo University Hospital, Emma Norton, Quality and Risk Manager from CHO2, Paula Custon Murphy, Director of Quality and Patient Safety for University Limerick Hospital Group, and Noreen Kennedy, Quality and Risk Manager for St. John's Hospital Limerick. We are extremely grateful for our patient partners in supporting us and continuously advocating for open disclosure as the right thing to do. We thank Bernie O'Reilly from Patients for Patient Safety Ireland for giving up her time and speaking to us today as well. We want to continue on this journey of normalizing open disclosure that when things go wrong, we must be open and transparent in particular with those affected. With their support and input, we are much stronger in making improvements as they will share their perspective as to where things went wrong and how things services can be improved. To that end, I hand over to Angela Tysel, who will speak to us about national implementation of open disclosure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorraine, for that lovely introduction, and we're delighted to have you with us, uh, Lorraine, uh, for the last 12 months, and bringing all your knowledge from the UK as well around the duty of candor, which has been greatly helpful to our project as well. So, um, so I suppose the focus today is on policy implementation, so I'm just going to bring up my presentation now. Hopefully, all will work here. <coughs> Can everybody see that now? Yes, I can see. That's it. great. So, okay. So, I suppose um, this is day three. Lorraine mentioned this is day three of the Open Disclosure themed week. And as you're all probably aware from the Twitter and LinkedIn and various um, communication we've been sending out, that we've had a different focus um, for each day this week. Day, day one being all about the patient perspective, day two, documentation of open disclosure. 
Today's theme is implementation, so our, our webinar is very timely in relation to, to the focus of, of today's messages around open disclosure. Just to say tomorrow is our focus is on training and Friday is on staff support. So um, we really send that message through that open disclosure is the right thing to do. And no matter what way you look at this, it's the right way, right thing to do for our staff, for patients, for organizations, for our patients' families. Um, so I'm just, I suppose the focus of today, I really want to kind of think about the local context of um, implementing open disclosure. So, but just to give you some of the national context, I suppose, to start off with and how this project all came about, we go back to 2010 when the HC and State Claims Agency um, actually joined together in um, trying to set up a national open disclosure program. And really, I suppose part of that work was um, you know, looking at some of the international evidence around open disclosure. And my colleague and co-lead at the time, Anne Duffy, and I did a lot of research into what was happening internationally, and, and in particularly in, in places like um, Canada, in uh, America, in Australia, and in the UK as well. So just ready to establish the evidence base. And then we wrote up our draft policy and guidance, and we took that to two pilot sites, the Matter Hospital in Dublin and Cork University Hospital. We, we really tested out that pilot or that that, that draft um, document with both of these sites, and which were really very, very well engaged with this. And um, we developed our kind of um our training program as well at that time, which, which consisted of the information sessions with staff and then the, at that time, four hour workshop. And really, the purpose of the pilot was to test out the, the draft document to establish any learning and, and review that learning and incorporate then into finalizing our national documents, which we then did and sent out for consultation. And just to say that um, there was very wide consultation with these documents and um, wide consultation also with, with patient representatives and patient groups and advocacy services, because their input has been really critical all the way through to this program. And you'll hear, hear Bernie talking about that later on. We then launched the policy and I suppose two of the main things I'd say to you about um, launching any open disclosure policy when you look at international evidence is that uh, it's not a policy you just write and just send out into the system to implement because it's really a culture changing piece of work and it also um, requires a change management approach. So we know with open disclosure, it's about changing that culture of deny and defend, blame and shame to a culture, and um, which I'll talk about later, that, that, that's a just culture, really. So, um, and in doing that, so the whole, uh, um, um, the important areas where they are to have leadership across all of the organisation at every level in the organisation who are driving this and buying into this. And also, um, you know, it was important that we had um, every stakeholder involved. So it wasn't just about the HSC and HSC services. It was about working with all of our other services, for example, our professional bodies, our regulatory bodies, our trade union um, bodies, the Royal Colleges, our undergraduate um, programs and our postgraduate programs, and in particular, our patient representative groups, and our patient advocacy groups. So it required a multiple stakeholder approach to implementation. So everybody driving this message through whatever forms, be it through the, um, you know, the codes of conduct, uh, professional um, codes of conduct for, for all of our um, uh, staff groups across the organization, be it into training programs in all of these organizations, being into messaging and um, policy change, et cetera. So the national training program has been a critical part of our implementation process and um, initially um, and Duffy and I went out into service ourselves to kind of lay the foundations around um, the training and the program but then we then started the national um, train the trainer approach then in 2015 where we actually um, identified, um, you know, staff um, were identified to become trainers in each service area, hospital groups, our CHO areas, um, you know, screening service, national ambulance service, and in our federation of voluntary bodies as well. Um, I have to say here that the identification of our leads as well, open disclosure leads in each of these areas has been absolutely um, critical and the work that these leads have undertaken and their commitment to open disclosure and taking on this role on top of their already full time role um, has been really a, one of the critical parts in relation to the implementation of this um, policy and programme. 
Again, with this program and the policy, uh, sending this policy out uh, into the system to be implemented, it was really important that we could develop resources and um, that would support the implementation, both of the program, but also the implementation of the of open disclosure in services. So uh, developing resources that would assist staff and organizations when they're preparing for and engaging in open disclosure with patients and their families, but also in relation to providing supports and making sure that there are supports accessible for patients and their families and also for the staff who are involved in or affected by patient safety incidents. Um, then there was the kind of uh, the approach we took was then working with our leads and our local trainers in rolling this out across all of all of our services, and that has involved continual consultation and learning and review and updates. And we did have the independent review of the pilot program that was undertaken by Dr. Jane Pillinger, and that report was published. And there was a lot of learning from that report, which we were then able to build into our um, policies and guidelines and into the way our program was rolled out and um, following on from, from those recommendations. So again, um, another part now that we're working on in relation to um, the open disclosure uh, rollout is looking at the performance, how we measure performance of open disclosure. So really, I'm going to talk about that a bit, a bit later on. So they're really the key areas. So when we look at the HSE change guide and they, you know, people's needs to find to find change 2018. And when they talk about the implement um, implementation phase of any change um, project, they talk about that it must involve practicing collective leadership that we must demonstrate visible commitment um, across all of the service and make decisions um, make decisions together that support the change that we're trying to initiate. There must be a dedicated focus on communication using a wide range of methodologies and digital platforms. So, for example, with open disclosure, um, how we communicate um, information on our programme is really through our, our website. Um, and please do visit our website because there are numerous resources on there for both the public and for um, staff and trainers that will actually assist you in implementing open disclosure. Um, through our training programs, we have a quarterly newsletter that we send out and that's actually up on our website as well. And um, we send out email updates um, through these webinars that, that we run. We try to do a monthly webinar. Um, through meetings, uh, various meetings with, with various staff groups, internal and external to the HSC and other bodies as well, including our patient representative bodies. Through study days, conferences, themed events like this week, this whole Open Disclosure Week we have this week, and then through social media. So again, really important that we communicate the work that we're doing and that we learn from the system as well. So really just to improve capacity for change and co-production. So this whole co-production and co-design is really important. When I talk about the input from services and from patient reps, so that they design this program with us going forward and, and help to re redesign it as well. And just uh, exploring ways to align the development of resources and to, to add value at local level. So for example, when we're um, looking at our resources, we're continually trying to align them with, for example, the instant management framework, because open disclosure is a critical part of the instant management framework. Um, with the patient safety strategy, which really um, sets out all of the work that we're doing in the National Quality and Patient Safety Directorate, and also aligning our resources with the legislation, both the Civil Liability Amendment Act, which is active, and with the, with the pending patient safety bill coming down the, the line. So really, um, when we talk about then bringing that change to life, so it's really having a clear vision about um, our purpose and outcomes um, of what it is we're trying to achieve with open disclosure. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to achieve is that, you know, patients are communicated with in a, a timely, open, honest and empathic manner when things go wrong in relation to their care that staff um, who are involved in a patient safety incident are supported as well, and that the patient and their family are supported. So ultimately that there'll be learning from, from that patient safety incident, and we can then use that learning to make quality improvements in our health services. So really we want to instill confidence in our, in our health service as well, through having that open and honest discussion with our patients. And that really is what we're trying to achieve. 
Um, so you can imagine that leadership and visibility is really important and having connected values and shared decision making. And when we think about the values of the HSC, that the open disclosure um, policy and program really feeds into all of those values of care, compassion, trust and learning. And you'll see there are the, the elements of trust and goodwill. And having that dialogue and networking, and if, if you were to ask me what was the one of the things that was most um, that was most helpful in relation to the work we've done in open disclosure, it's been working with various bodies, building up these relationships with our leads, our trainers, our patient representative bodies, and our external bodies, and working together jointly and trying to drive the, this message and, the, and this program throughout the whole um, health service. So really having that person-centered approach and focusing on, on what we're trying to do. So um, I'll reinforce again, the listening to the voice of patients, service users and staff. And for us as open to the Open Disclosure team, we have felt it's really important to be out in the system, listening to what people's experiences are and trying to build that into our program and listening to what staff need and you know, the developing resources to assist staff in, in what it is that, that we can help them with. And just for us all here on this call today to recognize that every contact counts, that every person makes a difference. And change management involves every single one of us um, working towards that change and we're working together and having that insight around what it is that, that we're trying to do. And again, just um, the training and education um, program has been critical because again, this is not a policy that you can, you can send out without bringing that training program behind it and the tools and resources to support it. So I mentioned earlier that this is a culture change in piece of work and it takes a long time to change culture. It can take years. So it's really, um, and you've heard Lorraine talk previously about the just culture, which is values um, supportive model of shared accountability. We're really, we want staff to feel safe to report errors and to ask for help when they've been faced with an issue beyond their competence. But also that we shouldn't hold practitioners accountable for systems feelings that they really have no control over. But again, that we can't absolve staff of the need to behave responsibly and professionalism um, and behave with professionalism and, and we don't tolerate conscious disregard of clear risk of professional misconduct. So that's the kind of culture changing. And there is the, just to bring to your attention, the Just Culture Guide, which is available on the Instant Management website that is there to help you when an incident has occurred, looking at the various, um, you know, the elements of the, of the culture assessment there. So just bring it back now to local level and you're all here today to find out what you can do at, at local level. Um, so really, um, I've just broken it up into various headings for you. And so at local level, it's really important that there's leadership at all levels in your organization, including um, clinical leadership, and that, and that that's identified somewhere. That there's an open disclosure lead identified in, in your service as well. Um, that, um, Sorry, I just moved up here. Seem to have frozen here. I'll just stop sharing for a moment. Sorry. I'll share again. I've got it here. Yeah, sorry. Okay. So an open disclosure lead has been identified in your organization and that there is open disclosure is actually um there is an open disclosure committee or the open disclosure is standing agenda uh, item on an existing committee. For example, your um, quality patient safety committee or your governance committee. So that really open disclosure is constantly on your agenda. This committee should include senior clinical representation from across the organization and compliance with open disclosure must also be included in the annual report on incident management and open disclosure. So think about how are you how are you ensuring that your organization is engaged in open disclosure and how do you report that through through the management structures? Moving on then to the policy, um, you know, it's really important to say that your that your service operates an open disclosure policy and the HSC policy for services that are, are HSC or HSC funded. That the local governance structure for the ownership and implementation of the policy is clear, that there's clear accountability in that service in relation to who is responsible for the operation of this policy, for the implementation of this policy, and making sure that, that policy is, is easily accessible for all staff and it is communicated to all staff. 
For instance, management is ready to, um, to ensure that open disclosure is undertaken as part of the instant management process and that is, is recorded in the patient service user record. So for your low level open disclosures, it's really important that you can document the salient points of the open disclosure um, discussion in the patient's healthcare record. And for formal open disclosure meetings, that there is a record of that open disclosure provided to the patient and the family um, following on from the formal meeting. And also really importantly, and there's a lot of work happening on our um, NEMS, our National Instant Management System, that the open disclosure data fields are completed on, on NEMS. And again, we're going to be doing some more work on those data fields going forward in relation to the patient safety bill coming down the line. Moving on then um, in relation to implementation, um, it's demonstrating that you provide support um, for patients and service users and their families who require immediate and ongoing um, um, support in the aftermath of the patient safety incident. And that the organisation identifies a designated person or key contact person to liaise, to liaise with the patient and or service user and their family or their relevant person during that open disclosure and instant management process. And this is really important so that from the outset that uh, when the incident has occurred that they know uh, they have the name and number of a person that they can contact if they have questions, a person who can support them preparing for an open disclosure meeting, who can um, be there to uh, meet and greet them and bring them to the room, etc. It's just such an important role and I think it's, it's underestimated actually the importance of that role. Also, um, do you make the open disclosure patient information leaflet available for patients? So when, an open, when a formal open disclosure meeting is happening, we have a very nice little leaflet that is available that you can provide to patients and their families to help them prepare for open disclosure in relation to what to expect and how they can prepare for that meeting. And then um, does your organisation provide information to patients and service use on the patient advocacy services that are available to them? And this week we, we have launched a very nice document, which it's a, it's a list of all the patient support services and advocacy services and resources that may be beneficial to patients and their relevant persons who've been involved in a patient safety incident. And that's actually on our uh, website. If you go on to hd.ie forward slash open disclosure and go into information for patients in the public, and you'll find that document on there. So it's a really helpful document, which brings together what we, what we feel are the key services. It's, it's not an exhaustive list, but we, I'm sure you'll find it helpful. Just in relation to support for staff, and again, we all know that when, when a patient safety incident occurs, this can be devastating for the staff involved because none of our staff go to work with the intention of causing harm to patients. And when something does happen, it can be devastating for staff also. So it's really important that they are aware of the resources that are available for them and that they can support these, these services and that there are nominated staff support services within the organisation. Also, do you make the Assist Me model of staff support available to staff? And it's a really helpful little booklet that provides very practical um, advice and support and links to support services as well. And again, you get that on our website. And, and really importantly, that managers are aware of their role in relation to supporting staff involved in patient safety incidents. So in relation to training, it is really important the staff are aware of the training requirements in relation to open disclosure, that they're provided with access to training, that there are open disclosure trainers available and accessible for your organisation, and that open disclosure is included in staff induction and orientation programmes and staff handbooks. It's really important that the staff uptake of training is monitored within the organisation and that these training records are maintained by the organisation locally. And um, you're all aware of that the open source say, is mandatory training, and um, you'll be all familiar with the various components of that. Uh, again, visibility. So making open disclosure visible in, in your organisation, and that's really about um, how are you demonstrating the visibility? So it can be through team meetings, newsletter, local internet, just special interest meetings or groups, and through your quality and safety committee. And also that um, you provide uh, um, information for the public through your patient information leaflets, posters, internal communications as well. In relation to performance measurement and quality assurance, um, that you monitor the performance of your policy and that you um, provide a report to senior management on the operation of the policy. 
And with the um, National Open Disclosure Framework, which is currently being published by the Department of Health and the consultation um, process has, has been completed with that framework, there will be a requirement going forward for for all service areas to, pre to present an annual report to the Department of Health on open disclosure. And we'll look at that in a moment, the various components of that report. So in relation to the current open disclosure performance measurement program, we are, will be looking at the development of a KPI for the patient safety bill, um, policy compliance and assurance tools, and the measurement of patient experience. And there's um, a large piece of work happening around the development of a patient experience tool, um, which we're working with, um, with, with an external uh, body on that. And we will also be looking at um, the uptake of open disclosure training. And there we four work streams at the moment looking at each of those components of performance measurement. And um, I just covered all that there. And we have an oversight work stream as well looking at that. So in relation to the annual report on open disclosure, these are the um, elements that the um, department are, have put into the national policy framework as being required for the content of an annual report. And it's really that the service can um, indicate that they operate an open disclosure policy. And um, they will be looking at um, the training that's being provided in that service and breaking it down into the various training uptake by different staff groups. They'll be looking at evidence of the availability of support structures for all staff, clinical and non-clinical, who've been involved in patient safety incidents. Um, at the moment, the, uh, the, what, the support structure for patients isn't in there, but we have given feedback on that as a necessity for that to be equally um, reported on in the annual report that we can provide um, information on the support structure for patients and service users. The number of appointed and clinical um, and trained clinical and managerial open disclosure champions within the organisation. The number of open disclosure meetings or um, discussions initiated and closed. So that would be looking at your NIMS data. Um, evidence of compliance with open disclosure training um, and ev oh, sorry, evidence of compliance with uh, mandatory open disclosure requirements in the patient safety bill. That would be when that bill is commenced. There'll be um, separate reporting around that there and any evidence of learning that has occurred. And we do publish an annual report every year for the open disclosure program and it's on the website. And we do a full chapter on sharing the learning in that report. So just as well, alongside the implementation of the open disclosure policy is the implementation of the open disclosure legislation. And um, that is built into all of our training programs and there will be specific um, training coming down the line with the initiation of the patient safety bill and we'll be developing um, training programs around that and um, various roadshows around the country. So do be, um, you know, rest assured that we will be supporting you in the role of the patient safety bill going forward. So I'm just going to finish up there and, um, you know, our web, our resources are there to help you and we'll be sending out this presentation to you all after today's webinar. So um, do do go on to our website and do email our office if you have any queries. So I'm just going to pass you over now to um, Moya Wilson um, at Sligo University Hospital who's going to talk about their experience at Sligo. So thank you very much, Moya, and over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Angela. Um, so I suppose we have implemented um, open disclosure. We've done a lot of training down through the years um, and we have a lot of train. We have a lot of trainers trained here in the hospital to support that. But I suppose one of the things that um, came up for us um, was that whilst um, there was a good uptake and is a good uptake on the, the sessions on the, the modules online, module one and module two, and they're certainly highly rated, that people were coming back to us and saying that, you know, we really miss the the face to face piece of the original workshops that were rolled out prior to um, prior to everything going online. So we took that on board and with the help of the national team, we um, developed um, a pilot to, and the aim of the pilot was to build the capacity of staff uh, to prepare and manage open disclosure meetings. I suppose just to give people um, the, the support to know that they would be able to do this and give them the opportunity to practice it. And so this is um, a follow on module from modules one and two and is, is intended as a support. And I suppose our experience to date has been that um, it has been very well received. Um, I suppose what I really like about it was that it was developed by clinicians. 
Um, so I suppose the approach that we took and Angela mentioned there about clinical leadership. So it's fine having um, an open disclosure lead in the hospital. I'm the open disclosure lead here in Sligo, but I really felt that um, for this to be sustained, we needed clinical leadership. So in terms of developing the pilot, the way we went about that was um, we approached clinicians from um, across all the directorates uh, within the hospital. And um, I suppose Angela talked about change management. So it was important to, um, you know, get people who would be cons considered early adopters and who would be able to influence um, the staff that they work with. Um, and initially they were, um, I suppose, a bit anxious about the way it was going to go in terms of, you know, they felt that they needed to be supported in rolling out open disclosure for their teams. Uh, but with the help of um, the national team, they soon learned that this was very, very manageable. Um, we also looked at, can we move on maybe to the next slide, please? Sorry, no. Okay. So um, we also included the, the clinical leads um, for NCHDs and interns. And um, as Angela said in her piece, they're responsible for implementing the training program. And the training program has definitely been a huge support because there is a huge willingness uh, for people to engage um, in, in, in this. Um, we also... Uh, we also um, have a patient representative, and again, this was really important. This was we approached um, a patient rep on our on our patient forum, and this made um, this made a big difference to us. Um, nurse practice development again, because this wasn't just um, seen as something that um, the NCHDs needed. It was something that. Um, was going to be um, rolled out to nurses as well. So when we pulled the, the group together, we had uh, nursing patient uh, representatives and we had um, uh, consultants and NCHDs. And we rolled out the, the, the pilot workshop to them. And what was really important about that, I think, was that we used service specific scenarios so if we were rolling it out to orthopedics, we had a scenario that was specific to them that they could really get involved in. And the big thing was um, the role play. Now, I know I'm not a real fan of getting involved in role play myself, but the feedback from it was absolutely um, superb. And through all of that, then we developed a clinical site lead. So somebody who is to going to champion this or is championing it um across the um the clinical um within the within within the with the clinicians and this i found has been huge in getting the sessions up and running and getting buy in from um all our clinicians so to date we have rolled it out to well we've rolled it out in different ways as well We've rolled the sessions out um, team by team for medics because there's far more of them. We were able to roll it out for some of the, sm the smaller specialties like um, ENT, for example, at their uh, specialty meetings. So the, the sessions, as I'm sure you know, take about two hours or so, two and a half hours, between two and two and a half. The big thing I would say to people that made a big difference for us was that um, we did try to manage the time to within the two hours, but we gave them lunch or breakfast, depending on whatever time of the day. And that made a huge difference. Um, that made a huge difference to us to get the buy in because people felt well, you know, that we could work during the um, we could work during the time we were eating. And that was the way it had to be because time is very precious. Um, and it certainly is a big challenge in getting people in to do this. Um, even though the feedback once people have um, attended the sessions is very, very good. And they're happy to come back again or they're happy to encourage um, their colleagues to come back. Um, so the role play was definitely a big a big part of it and people said that it was really worth it to come and 
be uncomfortable, I suppose. Um, then the other thing that we use this specifically for really was around um, documentation of meetings because documentation um, in healthcare records tends to be not as good as we would like it to be. And certainly we did focus on that um, at the time. So if we move on to the next one. I think that's so, oh, sorry. OK, um, sorry, Angela. No, my, I had. So I suppose our, our next steps really are around to continue with um, training for all specialties that includes nursing and NCHDs and to work on a piece um, around the documentation of open disclosure, because, you know, that still is something that requires um, a significant piece of work, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Moya. And we'll just hand over now to Emma Norton, who's quality risk manager in Community Healthcare West. Thank you, Moya. Thanks, Emma. Good morning, everybody. And thanks, Angela and the team for this opportunity um, to, I suppose, share what we have done so far in Community Healthcare West. So my name is Emma Norton, and I'm the quality patient safety and risk manager in Community Healthcare West, which encompasses uh, Go and Mayo and Roscommon and community organization. Um, so I just, I suppose, want to tell you a little bit about what we have done so far. We are at the relatively early stages of full implementation, while in the past there would have been, you know, a lot of training done. A lot of that training was due for a fresher and also a lot of the people that were identified as open disclosure trainers had left the service, had retired or had moved on. So we were kind of starting from scratch really again with, it, with needing to recruit a number of new trainers. So I suppose in terms of kind of what we have done so far to try and promote open disclosure, we've run different communication campaigns, we've put up posters, we've, um, you know, social media on Twitter, things like that. So trying to, I suppose, raise the profile open disclosure and what people understand by it was one of our kind of starting points. We've also included on the agenda of the monthly senior management team quality safety and service improvement committee. So it's been talked about at a senior management level and, you know, people are starting to engage in what open disclosure means, you know, in, in the true sense of the word um, or of the phrase and, and what is because it's the right thing to do. We also started looking at our training statistics. We had a data manager that commenced in post earlier this year. And one of the challenges we had was that some of the um, information on HSE land was not accurate in terms of some people were in twice, you know, et cetera. You're probably all well familiar with the challenges. So we did, did a little bit of, I suppose, looking in, in depth at that by comparing our HR list to that and actually getting, you know, a little bit more cleaned up with data from that. That's been a good improvement for us. Um, we also looked for train new trainers we went out to each of the services and asked could we you know ask people to be involved in this and to develop um the, their skills in terms of being an open disclosure trainer so um national open disclosure came down and comp completed that train the trainer um, program for us which was really useful and um we kind of looked at how we can kind of buddy up some of the existing trainers with some of the new trainers in order to kind of i suppose enrich the experience and following that, we've commenced the delivery of the key skills workshop with senior managers and senior clinicians, and we've got very good feedback from that. Um, we've also looked at developing a draft open disclosure procedure based on the national open disclosure policy, just to, I suppose, make it more aligned to our, our particular areas. Um, and we've decided to take a kind of a project based, um, I suppose, view in terms of the full implementation of open disclosure po policy in Community Healthcare West. So I'll talk a little bit more about that and how we're kind of starting that process. And obviously this week we're, we're doing some national open disclosure theme promotion work. We're tweeting, we're sending out packs. We've sent information out to our, our entire staff workforce as well. So it's good to get that conversation moving. So if you could go to the next slide then, please. So in terms of kind of what has worked well for us, um, I suppose the promotion of the open disclosure HC land module one and the senior management team focus on this has led to an increased uptake. We were at a very low level when we started at first, but we've been talking about it every meeting at QPS committee meetings, at senior incident management team meetings and at senior management teams meetings. And I suppose the senior management team engaging on it and, you know, promoting the completion of that module by all of their team and, and you know, it, it, it being driven down throughout the organization has led to an increase in the uptake of that training. The new trainers, as I've mentioned, that have completed the train the trainer course. So we now have 10 open disclosure trainers in CHW um, and probably one more in train as well. Um, 
So a number of the trainers are QPS advisors, and then we have trainers from care groups. So there might be representatives from social work, from nursing, and from other key groups. So what we have done is we've linked the QPS advisors with someone from the care group where possible. So to deliver the trainings, that kind of really enriches it and it gives a flavor of both the quality and patient safety side, but also the challenges that are within the organization and the kind of real life scenarios that our clinicians and managers are facing when they're when there is a patient safety incident and when they have to initiate open disclosure. Um, and there's been very good feedback from participants in those key skill workshops. I think the face to face as my colleague Moya said, has really, you know, enriches that and, you know, embeds some of the, the key principles of open disclosure that, you, you know, is not, not easy to get maybe just from HSE land. So these are the people that will be participating in open disclosure meetings so that they've found that very good. The excellent material avail available from the National Open Disclosure Office on their website um, and, and the material that they send out on a regular basis is really helpful. It's very professional. It's helpful for trainers going into training that they have this material. They have the posters. They have all the information that they need to deliver the training. So that's very useful. Um, what else has worked well? We have engaged with our local portfolio management offices to look at developing a specific project around open disclosure implementation in Community Healthcare West, which will involve a sponsor and key stakeholders. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on. So in terms of our open disclosure training stats, we've gone from, I suppose, 38 percent maybe in Q2 of this year to 57 percent compliance with module one. So we have a bit of a way to go, but, you know, it's, it's a slow and steady improvement um, and we're continuing to focus on that. Module two, 673 staff have completed that um, and we have 21 um, senior clinicians and uh, senior managers have completed the key skills workshop. And we identified, I suppose, the number of people that need to complete it. So we're kind of at around 18, 19 percent at, at this point, and we're continuing to arrange more training sessions um, with staff on that. So um, I just have a little picture there of one of our trainers delivering open disclosure training, and it's really powerful. I suppose the, the, the kind of key skills piece and the engagement piece and the kind of role playing piece. I think people do get a lot out of that training. Um, with when they're doing it and they're meeting colleagues and they're sharing different scenarios that they may have come across within their own area. So this is just an example of the awareness campaign that we're running this week um, with the theme of the right thing to do. We've looked at, I suppose, the benefits for open disclosure for staff, for our patients and service users, for the organisation. We're, you know, promoting the principles of open disclosure. And we're promoting patient and staff stories, which are very, very powerful. Um, and you'll hear from Bernie later on, but it really can embed the, I suppose, the, the trauma that can be caused to both patients and staff in relation to incidents. And if they're handled well by the organization, it really decreases that trauma. Um, and we've again promoting the training as part of this and looking at so people know where we're at in terms of training and that you know module one is required by everybody. So that's part of our campaign this week. So in terms of the open disclosure implementation project that I mentioned, so the process we have here in our portfolio management office is you have to develop a project initiation document um, that then has to be reviewed by the head of service. So our head of service for quality patient safety or patient safety and service improvement, then that's submitted to the chief officer and the senior management team for review. And they then um, decide whether this the project management office are going to support this project or not, or they may look for further information. And then the next step is a detailed project plan that involves key stakeholders, key deliverables and timelines to be developed before the project is initiated. So one of the things we will be looking for as part of this is that there's a, a dedicated person within each care group or service that is going to participate in this project along with quality and patient and quality and patient safety so that it's not just up to the quality and patient safety department to try and implement this. It really, really needs engagement by the services in order for it to be effective and for open disclosure to be fully embedded as part of our incident management process. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a kind of a snapshot of what, what that looks like and what the, what's continued in that project initiation document. It looks at the purpose and executive summary, the context, objectives, the strategic alignment, for example, to the patient safety strategy and to our own operational plan, the overall scope of the project, the benefits of it, its key deliverables, its key dependencies, the risks associated with it, and the resourcing and governance requirements around it. So it kind of allows us to, I suppose, approach this in a structured way as a project, as opposed to just trying to kind of get it over the line within each care group. So I, I, I'm hoping that it will be accepted by the project management office and that it will be effective and um, we can commence rollout quickly. 
Next slide, please. So some challenges and barriers and how we address these. So I suppose firstly was the initially poor module one compliance um, in terms of it being a mandatory training. So and some of that is, I suppose, the you know, the competition with other mandatory compliance requirements and training and people's time you know, being very precious and people being very busy. So we circulated the, the national newsletters. We had training requirements, memos. We raised at key meetings like the senior management team meeting and also um, QPS meetings and things like that. Some difficulty also releasing senior staff to do, attend the face to face key skills workshop. Um, again, due to service demands so we're promoting that at business meetings, at QPS team meetings, at senior management team meetings. We also had, I suppose, a, an issue, which is a good issue, really, even though it is a challenge of people requesting the face to face key, key skills trains when they're not actually required to do it. They will very unlikely to be involved, I suppose, in, in high level open disclosures and having to turn those people down for the moment because we don't have the trainers um, to actually be able to train all of these people. But in the future, if we get more trainers, we'd like to think that we would um be able to you know offer this key skills training to, to people that wish to attend it um other challenges maybe the delay in the patient safety bill which is impacting through the review of the national open disclosure policy and leading to a little bit of uncertainty sometimes when which we come across at our training groups um and then difficulty measuring accurately measuring the number of open disclosure meetings that are taking place um within our services particularly given that we're in a community service and it's we're quite you know spread out so there is a national work stream, you know, reviewing this and QPS advisors are raising it at our senior instant management teams and QPS meetings as well. In terms of governance leaders and leadership and oversight, it's a standing agenda item on the senior management team meeting. So it gets it gets discussed every month at that. Um, I also give an update at the senior management team meeting in relation to our training compliance in relation to kind of updates that are circulated from national and, for example, the newsletter that was circulated this week and they, you know, send it down throughout their management structures as well. Um, we will be having the senior management team members to attending the open disclosure face to face key skills workshop as part of our priority one group. Um, I mentioned already about the pro project initiation documents so that will be directly overseen by the senior management team if it's accepted as, as a project and that will, there'll be updates given on it every month at the senior management team meeting. Um, and then I suppose really the challenges of being able to capture the open disclosure meetings being taken at the moment it's you know a NIMS it's yes or no so there's a really reliance on the senior incident management team to ensure this is captured appropriately so one of the focuses of the project will be to you know develop processes and structures to support staff in doing that support from the national open disclosure team has been great you know they're always there at the end of the phone if we have a question and you know we've a lot of people that are new to the role um and it's they've been very very good to help us in training and rolling out that key skills workshop and i mentioned already the great material that's available and there's also monthly open disclosure leads meeting and that provides kind of i suppose support and any updates on progress of legislation of the national um hc open disclosure policy and you know the different project work streams that angela mentioned that are ongoing in relation to national open disclosure and um, that's really beneficial to be to be part of one of those work streams to kind of know what's going on um, at a national level. And that's it for me. So I'll hand you over to Paula Cusson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Emma. Uh, Paula Cusson Murphy. I'm the Director of Quality and Patient Safety for UL Hospitals Group. Like Emma, delighted to be able to present this morning and just to Give an oversight of what we have done as a group in relation to promoting open disclosure and compliance with the policy. I suppose the first critical piece for me when as the lead was establishing a robust group wide steering committee. Um, from my experience, we could not have progressed uh, the whole open disclosure implementation piece and compliance with the policy unless we had a good, strong, robust steering group with what I suppose clear objectives. Uh, everyone knew what the vision was, there was clarity of roles. And I suppose the big piece was that collective will, having people who were participating in the group who had a collective will and ownership of what we were trying to do was absolutely paramount. We certainly have learned as we go, and we have used a number of subgroups as part of the steering group to progress a number of our initiatives. The other piece that was absolutely critical for us at the start was having a patient voice at the table. Um, so we went to our local patient council. And they nominated a, a patient representative who's been part of the process and has guided us the whole way through. We have, I suppose, like, like Emma and previous speakers, 
the resources available from the national office have been absolutely invaluable to us between patient leaflets, between the quick, the quick guide and the newsletter. And as we've been going along, as they've been coming up, we've been using those documents to promote open disclosure and have been circulating them widely throughout the group via our comms team. Our comms team have been hugely supportive in that. So they, they, as the material comes out, we use our comms team to promote it and to circulate it widely throughout the group. The other piece I think has been invaluable to us is making sure that the executive management team and the council are fully briefed as regards where we are in the progress on the implementation of open disclosure. And um, that I think has probably been one of the critical pieces because at that forum, you have all your management structure and they're aware of where we're at, where we are with our training, where we are with open disclosure as regards to compliance with the policy and that then gains ownership and it becomes part of the norm the culture that this an open disclosure is something that's important as a group. Uh, next slide, please. The training, uh, similar to Emma, we didn't start off in a good place as well, but in fairness, over the last two years, we have gained momentum big time in relation to compliance with module one and module two. I suppose we keep promoting that it's mandatory, the module one is mandatory for all staff, and we've had to use novel approaches where line managers, who, as you as were, some of our staff do not have access to computers. So it's been allowing staff to actually have the time to complete that in their own environment, in their homes or whatever, and coming back with their cert to their line manager to say that they've completed. So we've had to use novel approaches and equally using a forum where staff come together and do the training together. So we have just have to have have had to be creative around how we do that. Identifying staff to train as train their trainers is, big, is a critical piece. And um, I suppose we did a big piece around that, the promotion of it. We went back, we reviewed our existing trainers, and then we did a huge piece across the group around identifying, well, who's going to do the training in the future and making sure that we have that representation for all the sites across the group. We were very clear that the commitment was rather than because we've seen that in previous previous training that some people do the training for the sake of doing the training, but the commitment to actually deliver the program afterwards isn't always there. So we were very clear up front that if you were going to be a trainer, then you had to commit to providing training. And we outlined how many training sessions we considered as well that people had to commit to across the years. So that's been a critical piece. Developing the pool of resources to support the frontline staff. Open disclosure can be a little bit challenging um, and people are a little bit nervous around it. And I suppose what we've done is we've, we've developed our pool of resources within our QPS team, but parallel with that, we've also developed our pool of resources as the trainers, but equally our PALS managers. And they are there to support the staff and staff know that, that if they are approaching open disclosure, that those resources are available to support them and guide them through the process. We've complemented this as well by using the communication training. We've recognised that the staff who were involved in that open disclosure, that the communications process, that training delivered by Winnie and Peter is invaluable. So we have also provided, had training provided on communications for the team that are providing the training, especially the palace manager. Critical for us, in, and this we have seen has been a huge sea change and has brought about, I suppose, that sea change both for patients and families, but also for staff was establishing the designated person's role. We have said in the group that the PALS manager are identified as the designated persons appointed to support the families and the staff involved in any open disclosure process. Um, and that's been a huge sea change because they now provide, I suppose what they do is they're, they're the guidance on how to approach the open disclosure process, but equally, they're the link for the clinical staff to the family, and they're the support for not only the family, but also the staff. Identifying the staff, we need to focus the training on and setting up a rolling program. We had a, we at the steering group so that there was absolute clarity around who do we want to train, as, as Emma said, having people turning up who are not going to be delivering the face-to-face -face open disclosure. It's important that there's clarity at the outset as regards who you're going to target your training on. And as a, as a steering group, we agreed that it would only be the senior staff within the organization from registrar level up, from CNM level up, from senior allied health level up at that grade that we would only deliver, that would be responsible for delivering open disclosure. So that narrows down the staff that you that you require to train. And that's really, really important. Have a rolling program of face-to-face -face training 
that is something that we found was absolutely crucial because in fairness to the trainers, what you need is, is you need a structure and a process that allows them to just turn up on the day and deliver the program. And I've identified a, a resource within QPS Beth who have been absolutely invaluable in that. So Beth is there and has the whole training program, I suppose, um, I, I, the, the important piece, the organisation, having your documentation ready, having your CPD points ready, having your um, having your training material available, having your room booked, all things that seem quite basic, but are absolutely critical to making sure that the programme goes forward. And so we have a rolling programme of dates set up right through to the end of the year, and it's absolutely invaluable. Next slide, please. Um, I suppose the benefits of having a quality approach around this is that we're, we're, we're supporting staff to make informed decisions around open disclosure. Prior to not having the trained resources and, prior, and, and having a broad pool, staff struggle with this, but this is a hugely supportive process that we're rolling out. It certainly strengthens the relationship between the patients and the family, despite the circumstances. And that's the feedback we're getting from families and that's the feedback we're getting from staff. It engages the patients and their family and those close to them during a difficult time. And it's absolutely critical. And we are seeing that there's increased patient satisfaction. Even though this is a difficult process and difficult for families, the feedback is really positive around having the designated support structure, having informed staff, making sure that they know how they're doing the open disclosure process and making sure that those pre-meetings are happening and that we're using the pre-meeting checklist and we're using the post-meeting checklist, all the guides that are there to, to guide people through the process. It certainly has improved our follow up and after care because we now link with families after the after the process and with patients to ensure that they're supported. We're providing the assurance and we're providing a consistent approach across the group to the open disclosure. By having dedicated training resources as part of the trainers, as part of GPS and PALS, we're now making sure that our approach is consistent, which is absolutely critical to make sure that we're doing open disclosure correctly. And we're certainly, we, we certainly feel that this is going to help prevent litigation as well. If we do this well, it's absolutely vital. Okay, next slide, please. What's next for us? I suppose this week is, is a huge bonus because it gives us another opportunity to promote across the group the, old, the whole open disclosure, the priority of it, and, and, and the whole process around the just culture and everything. So we've got a rolling program in place across the week. It started in one way in Croom Hospital and where we have well, open disclosure information stand. We have stickers, balloons, bonds, and we've arranged that we have two training sessions as well happening this week across the group and face to face open disclosure. So we have a process, we have a rolling program across the week, which I think is, a, is it just raises the awareness again around the whole open disclosure piece and it's, and it's hugely beneficial. I've put up there, and you can see on the right, the OD sticker for us, and Noreen's going to talk to this later on in detail in relation to this. Noreen, my colleague from St. John's, started this process. And what we've learned as a group is that to assist staff when they're doing the open disclosure, that we, we've taken it a step forward in the sense that we now have um, a guiding document. What we're doing is we're doing with a big A4 sticker that we're going to put into the patient chart. One side of it is guiding in how to do the open disclosure, and the other side, it's just going to capture all the salient points of how to do open disclosure well, so that you're capturing it, documenting it well within the patient record. For us, the, net, the other priority is, is continue to roll out the face-to-face -face training. We're conscious that we're heading into the winter period and it's going to be a challenge, but we're going to keep rolling the program um, because I think it's, it's gained momentum at this stage. People know it's happening and we're going to continue to continue with that. It's similar to Emma, I think the, the other critical piece for us is, is, is audit of compliance. We've started the audit process. We've started auditing our compliance with in relation to the open disclosure and the documentation within, within records. And I suppose as a result of that, we've also found that there is a challenge around the whole documentation piece. And that's why we're coming up with the use of formal process so that it can be added to the patient record to ensure that we're doing the open disclosure and that we can see it within the notes. We don't want to see in the notes as what we saw when we did our initial audit was a discussion with the patient and no reference to open disclosure, even, even though we know that the open disclosure, that, that was the discussion that happened with the patient. So it's trying to structure that um, and, and to support staff in the process so that they can pick it up on their own clinical area and they know that this is the guide on how to do it and then to support it with the resources that we have. 
and that's me, thank you. So I'm going to hand over to Noreen, Noreen Kennedy in St. John's Hospital, who is going to provide you with the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. And we're going to have some questions and answer at the end of uh, when all speakers are finished. So thank you very much for that. And over to you now, Noreen. Thanks very much, Paula, and thanks, Angela. Um, my name is Noreen Kennedy. I'm the Quality and Patient Safety Manager in St. John's Hospital. And I have a presentation here on a quality initiative that we undertook in St. John's Hospital um, uh, in October 21 and have evaluated and work is ongoing um, with it. The, the We developed guidance on um, the documentation of the salient points of open disclosure. So why um, we we undertook this project um, was because um, as part of the incident management framework audit, which is a yearly audit um, to monitor ourselves against our um, incident management, also there was an opportunity there to look at our open disclosure figure and our compliance um, for documentation of the salient points of open disclosure was 40% um, and that was back in, in 2021. Also on the NIMS forum, staff were ticking that open disclosure were, was completed but this was not correlating with what was in the incident record or when you spoke to families um, they may have said well I spoke to the nurse or this or that, none of that was documented. When we're doing um, uh, reviews and preliminary assessments, it was very obvious um, that nothing was being documented in relation to open disclosure, what was said to the family, who was spoken to. A lot of documentation is in OK, next of kin informed, which really wasn't telling us anything or what was said. And also from discussions with staff and especially some consultants, and we did a lot of work in theatres, um, they were able to tell me exactly who they spoke to, what was said, but again, nothing was documented um, as to um, what was said and who was spoken to. So that was like a great rationale for us to, you know, identify, you know, we have an issue here and we want to improve it. And um, so what we, I'll move to ne next slide, please, Catherine. Then the actual guidance document I'm going to show you now, so it'll make more sense as I, I, I continue on. So the guidance is taken from the national framework, the national policy on the documentation of the salient points. So this is a, a page that is available on every clinical area of what to document, be it low level or high level incident, exactly what to document because people didn't know what. Once we identified with them that we needed documentation, they said, okay, what do we write down? So we, we really only took the information from the national guidance just to document the, the key points under the following headings. So we're all very familiar with them and there's no need to go through them, but the key, a lot of uh, uh, purposeful was who, who the disclosure was made to. And, and that was quite a big piece to document the name of who you spoke to, document, you know, which member of the team spoke to who, who was present and the salient points then of the open disclosure meeting, whether it be low level meeting or high level. And also, as you'll see on the right here of, there's a, a sticker there, open disclosure. That sticker is just up then in the clinical file or even the nurses are putting it in their nursing notes. But for high level open disclosure, we're putting it in the clinical file and um, the sticker is going in with um, the salient points of open disclosure. It helps us audit it. It helps us when we're doing reviews to identify, oh, it's there. And for the staff, oh yeah, it's definitely done. And um, there's um, been a great improvement in terms of practice around the open disclosure and the open disclosure sticker. So if next slide, please, Catherine. So that's that was just what we did. So and how we did it, we spoke a lot to staff um, when we identified the issue. We, as I said, we used the guidance. We looked at what was existing and there wasn't a lot um, there as in to what you know, in terms of the clinical file and what the to do piece. So that's why we felt that staff needed more guidance. Um, we completed the draft template and that was signed off um, by a committee. F the feedback was re reviewed and we got a lot of feedback from theatre. I suppose that's where we at the time had a loss of incidents. And one of our, you know, uh, uh, a regular a surgical consultant here found the template extremely useful to use for documentation of open disclosure. Um, 
from our open disclosure training with our medical staff and we implemented the guidance on documenting there and um, it was very interesting on our feedback evaluation and following a discussion with one of the staff they you know from the training that it was okay to say sorry so for us I mean I thought that was excellent feedback from our training it was very simple the feedback we've had since simple easy to use it's very clear and very positive and it has been implemented and um, we're a year down the line now and we've just just if you next slide, please, Catherine. So the we've completed, a, we've re-audited, and our in, our documentation of open disclosure has improved from forty to sixty percent. Now we are aiming for a hundred percent percent compliance, and this is achievable. And um, this week has been, I suppose great for um there's been great communication there's been a great momentum and build up around open disclosure and our focus here at our stand this week in the hospital was around the documentation of open disclosure where oh, you know we had our display stand but we also had a workshop running simultaneously with our sticker with um you know pages from the clinical file you know you know just taking people through what to do um we also have when when we receive incidents or notifications of some, you know, category one or two incidents, what we do now is if it isn't done, we go back to the clinician or the staff member to retrospectively document in the file just to ensure this piece is done and to reiterate the practice of documenting open disclosure in the clinical file. Um, we have training tomorrow in open disclosure in St. John's and again we will we will be um, teaching more around the documentation using our guidance on induction we um, on our open disclosure piece we we talk about the um, documentation as well um, and on Friday we have pastries in our canteen and I'll run a, a we'll run a workshop again on the documentation um, so as I say we're aiming for 100% compliance um, but you know this wouldn't have been possible without the support we received receive from the, the National Office, from Angela and Catherine and team, and also from Paul and our team in UHL, you know, through the open disclosure um, lead meetings and committee meetings and bring it collectively together. So I suppose just to, to finish off the documentation of open disclosure, you know, is the right thing to do um, for, for all. And it's great that you know, I think we found a way to work towards it and our compliance is improving and I, you know, I would hope we will and are aiming for 100%. Thanks very much. And um, Bernie, I believe, is next um, the presentation. Thank you very much, Noreen. And um, pass over now to Bernie O'Reilly from Patients to Patient Safety Ireland. So I'll stop sharing that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. And um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, so I was I've been a member of patients for patient safety since 2015. Um, I was thinking back to when I first heard the words open disclosure, and it was shortly after I joined the group. Um, at probably I think it was the second meeting that I attended. Angela gave us a talk on the subject and invited us to be part of the fabric of change. Prior to that, Cornelia Stewart had mentioned to me that things were changing around being open with patients and families who had experienced an adverse incident. I know for sure the words open disclosure and adverse incidents didn't exist for me in 2006 when my husband died following a bowel resection operation. My experience of healthcare in 2006 was far from open, not blatantly dishonest, but I felt I got a very scant version of the truth. Incidents don't come much more adverse than a fit man aged 50 going from good health to death in three days. The explanation was sepsis and how the patient's body had let him down. Perhaps the failure of a stapling device, but a three hour delay during Tony's operation when the surgical team left to perform emergency surgery on another patient was not the reason. So much so that there was no written record of that part of the patient's journey in the patient's file, except in this story, that's exactly what happened. Every aspect of Tony's care from the commencement of his operation to his tragic death was deeply concerning for our family. My search for answers spanned many years and some of my questions remain unanswered. Now, before anybody gets concerned that I'm going on a big negative rant, I'm not. In fact, that fortunate meeting with Angela has led to the subsequent eight years during which I have been an absolute supporter of the HSC open disclosure policy, an encouraging voice for the cultural change required. I want that honesty. I want it for myself. I want it for patients and their loved ones. 
I want it for any healthcare person who has been compromised in the past, burdened now, or will face, face a decision in the future. I think most people agree that open disclosure is the right thing to do. Withholding information to patients or their family members without an extremely good reason is wrong. But the right thing to do is not always the easy thing to do. Patients and their loved ones are entitled to know details of anything that affects their health and well-being, anything that has happened to impact them in a negative way. Open disclosure is honesty. I think most people are honest most of the time, and I think when it comes to open disclosure, it will flourish in the, if the environment where it provides the correct supports. The HSE policy is clear. Open disclosure is a patient's right and a professional's responsibility to adhere to. Training is readily available, and the numbers now support the uptake of that training. It is unlikely anyone working in healthcare is unaware of their obligations. So from an information and training point of view, the stage is set. The next part is the more difficult part, the doing, engaging in the honesty. That depends on individuals and how well they feel supported to enter into often very difficult conversations. When I was the one asking the questions, they were big questions. Relatives of dead patients ask really difficult questions. And the answers to those questions give rise to more and more questions. And to be on the other side of the desk answering them is one uncomfortable place. If the answers involve addressing an adverse incident, that has to be the most awfully challenging conversation. It took me a long while to understand that harming a patient is every healthcare worker's worst nightmare. For many years, I felt only my own pain and sense of loss. I asked a doctor once what their thoughts on the subject were. This person had dedicated their life's work to patients and I knew I would get a meaningful response. Words I didn't expect came up, fear, shame, disbelief, loss of self, judgment, sadness, defeat, loss of my career, litigation. So all those emotions have to be dealt with and then face the patient or the next of kin. Well, that's some load to be carrying. Then consider the many factors that contribute to patient safety incidents, systems failures, human judgments, misjudgments, distractions, mistakes, and people being stretched beyond their capacity to perform within safe parameters. Now that we have reached the influences that enable or disable the environment for open disclosure, more new words, just culture, a culture where people are supported, a culture that recognises the needs of both parties in any open disclosure situation, patients and healthcare professionals. There are at least two victims in every situation, the process of protecting the patient's right to honesty, an appropriate apology, an appropriate care plan, or an appropriate response to next to kin where the patient is deceased, coupled with the healthcare worker's right to support through all levels of their working environment to achieve a culture of safety where staff are treated fairly when involved in an error, mistake or adverse event. That ac accountability is not a standalone element, but part of a supported fair process where learning from mistakes and improvement to patient safety are to the fore. When something has gone wrong, an apology goes a long way to say sorry is like inviting someone to meet you at a point of reconciliation. Done properly, it's a powerful extension of human feeling. I was looking for a particular Lucien Leap uh, quote while writing this, and I couldn't find it. Sometimes you don't find what you want, but instead you find what you need. And this is his comment on apologies. On the apology front, I am very concerned people put too much emphasis on the fact that this may reduce your chance of being sued. I happen to think it will, but I don't think that's the reason to do it. I've been struck by the fact that openness, transparency and full disclosure and apology when indicated is not only an essential part of treatment for the patient, it is also an essential part of treatment for the doctor or caregiver. And I don't think that case has been made. Because when you're not open and honest with people, you're lying. And lying corrupts your own integrity. So honesty, transparency and apology are just as important for the doctor as the patient. Over the last eight years, I've been seeing dedicated people making headway on open disclosure. The will to succeed is there, but there is also pushback. Those natural emotions that self-protect. I am not sure we have reached that place of safety where just culture prevails. I think there are pockets of it but it's not everywhere. People are still fearful of being punished. I cannot measure how successful open disclosure is, 
the numbers availing of training are very impressive. But the real proof is in the feedback from people involved in high level open disclosure meetings, feedback from patients, feedback from healthcare professionals. Thankfully, my awful event was 16 years ago now, and I don't want to be the test case for today. I absolutely hope things have changed. A lot of people have put in a lot of effort to change culture. I did have a small no harm incident during a stay in the Matter Hospital in April 2019. A young intern was trying to insert a cannula into my hand for IV medication. Uh, the previous one had tissued. He explained he was learning and he had to do so many before he signed up as proficient in the task. He tried twice unsuccessfully and then he said he would get someone more experienced to do it. He seemed a bit deflated when I said I was waiting to go to theatre any minute. He said that in that circumstance he shouldn't have been inserting the cannula at all and he was extremely sorry for subjecting me to something totally unnecessary. I said I would have been none the wiser if he hadn't told me that his honesty was wonderful and to always keep that part of his engagement with patients and that all his other medical skills would become proficient in time. An apology makes a huge difference. This was a low grade exchange. The bigger the issue, the bigger the challenge and emotional upheaval. I have adjusted to life without my husband. I haven't got over how he died and how myself and my daughter were treated at the time. I know healthcare is risky and fraught with potential for harm. Honesty is a core value and expected of trusted professional people. In turn, professional people are the fibre of healthcare systems entitled to be supported in their jobs to do the best they can for patients. And that includes when they make mistakes or things go wrong. We have to keep open disclosure in focus. Listen to staff regarding the barriers. Patients need the honesty. As a footnote, we also need to address the litigation culture. We need more mediation services, less legal process, better ways to handle situations when harm is done. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Bernie. Um, I think your thoughts just bring together nicely all of the mess you've been trying to bring forward today. So I might just ask all of our panellists to maybe turn on their cameras now and we can answer any questions from, from the group. So I suppose in relation to yourself, Bernie, um, is there anything that you'd like to see happening um, you know, in the next couple of years that, that perhaps you can't see happening at the moment? Is there anything else you feel we should be doing more of? Well, I absolutely think that, you know, um, situations that are, are fraught, you know, where people are, have been harmed. I think mediation is, is, a, is a great way to go. Like, I think we need to keep, you know, I think litigation, it's, it's a cold, harsh way of dealing with um, harm to, to patients. Like, I, I, think it, I think the courts are the wrong place to be at the moment. They seem to be the only places that people could go if they have, you know, if they, if they feel that that's their their way to, to finding some kind of conclusion. But I think mediation services, we need to build medi mediation that people are meeting in the more, um, I suppose, reconciliatory way than, than, than or is an angsty kind of place to go when you've got a, a patient issue. Mm -hmm. And do you see the role of patient representative groups as being um, you know, critical in relation to you know, the, the continued implementation of open disclosure, Bernie? I do, and I also think, you know, that patient advocacy services that support people, you know, that, you know, are traveling a journey. Like I, I didn't have any help at the very beginning. So when, when, I, when, I, when I felt the barriers were down with the hospital, like there was only two ways to go, like it was go to the press or go to, through the legal process. And I did spend three years in the legal process, but like it's, 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 it's a very unpleasant place to be for when you're trying to deal with, you know, the grief of loss or the grief of, that, you know, the grief of someone being harmed in a profound way. Mm -hmm. And because of that, Bernie, you've spoken to me previously about that financial cost for you as well, going into that process and, you know, pa patients need money to pay for independent reviews and, you know, sometimes they yeah, can be absolutely. forced out of that process as well. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Like, I mean, solicitors will take on your case, but like you have to have expert witnesses to back your case up and, and, and they all have to be paid, they're professional people. So, before you know it, you're on this this kind of you're you're actually hemorrhaging money and like if it wasn't what you wanted if if like I I, I didn't want financial I didn't want a financial like there was nothing measured Tony's loss I just wanted the answers to exactly how that happened and it just like I was not I was three years looking at litigation I was probably nine years looking like you know some of the some of the bits of the jigsaw of the story of what happened to Tony they came to me like through 
the press or, you know, little, I got little bits of information from different places along the way, whereas I should have had a full picture of exactly what happened from the outset from the people who were caring for Tony. Like an anaesthetized patient is, is they're totally incapacitated, so they, they're not responsible for, for themselves. You, you, you trust the people who are caring for you when you're in that situation. Thanks very much, Bernie. I'll just hand over to the floor, Mary and Catherine, if there's any questions coming in from our attendees and any questions from the panel either to each. Yeah, uh, thank you. Lots of comments. Uh, thank you, Bernie, saying, you know, people are really impacted by the honesty and how, you know, they'll, they're going to relay that back to staff and use it, you know, to, as part. So really, I think, I don't think there's words, I don't have words to even say how impacted uh, people are by what you're saying. So uh, that's that's what most people are saying in the chat. Um, just there was there was and there was another comment from someone. Um, Raymond said, you know, thanks very much for all the different approaches uh, that we've used today um, for for this for this webinar. There was one question from Moya. I'm not sure. Hopefully Moya can hear me. Um, and it was whether you were rolling out these sessions to community and primary care. Uh, no, no, Mary, we're not. It's it's in the acute, uh, but but um, you guys are rolling it out. In yeah, fairness, yeah, I yeah. think isn't yeah. that is. Yeah. Now the person had directed the question to you, so I just wasn't sure if it was oh, someone right. in your area. No, but just um, yeah. yeah. We were very fortunate. We were very fortunate to to be the pilot site for this for the acutes, and I mean, I don't want to give the impression that we developed this. I mean. We, we worked and our clinicians did work very, very closely with the national team to develop this, but this is not our pilot. This is a national pilot that was um, undertaken in Sligo and we're very proud of it. Mm -hmm. And thank Thanks, you for all your And to be fair, I think the question may well have come in before. Um, I know Emma would have done her session and talked about yes. the rollout within the CHO. So um, yeah. hopefully we're, we're responding to that person. And if not, I'm sure they'll get back to us uh, by email. Um, there is just another question that came in there. Maybe, Angela, for you, if you wanted to answer it. Um, it talks about the term next of kin, that it seems to always cause confusion among staff and for the relatives and patients. Will the patient safety bill clarify this? Yes, the, the term next of kin is gone now um, completely. We shouldn't be using the term next of kin. So the Patient Safety Bill um, uh, refers to, and the Civil Ability Amendment Act refers to the relevant person. And that can that is the person identified by the patient or service user who they are happy for their information to be shared with. And that may not, you know, I mean, um, before we talk about who is the patient next can be in there your wife, husband, partner, son, daughter, but anybody can nominate who their relevant person is. It could be a friend, actually. So we really need to stop using the word next to kin. It needs to be taken out of all of our kind of records and, you know, the standard documentation templates we use for admissions and our services as well. So um, in fact, I think from October, they said we shouldn't be using the term at all, actually. So um, I just may uh, go back to the previous question around are we rolling this out to community that and this is the new face-to-face -face training program. It, it takes approximately two and a half to three hours. Um, it is going to be rolled out across all of our um, health and social care services. And what we're doing at the moment is training new trainers in, in this new revised face-to-face -face program, but also updating and retraining our previous trainers so that they can roll out this new model. And um, in relation to the Sligo approach, it's really what we want to see going forward because um, going back to, you know, this was a, a, a pilot program with, with Sligo University Hospital and CHO1, and we, we worked with consultants um, from the community and the hospital in developing this program and with senior managers. So it's really a program for doctors and senior managers developed by doctors and senior managers. And what I really, um, what really impacted me in Sligo that was rolled out, you know, using a directorate approach that we had the, the senior clinicians from each of those directorates um, were there in those training sessions. They were leading, they were engaging, they were setting the kind of the expectations of what they expect from, from their staff and in their and their unit across all of the various levels of, of, of medicine and the various specialties in the organization. 
And really, um, and I think Moya mentioned as well, and it's been really part of us that we use cervix specific scenarios to make this real. So you know, skills, the new training, um, we look at the role play of a low level event, then we look at the preparation for and the management of um, you know, high level open disclosure, looking at the staff support element, patient support element as well, and documentation. So this really is the model that we want to see going forward that uh, rolling it out and getting clinicians leading this, um, which is really, if you look at all the international evidence, clinical leadership here and um, senior management leadership is vital to open disclosure. And that, uh, that will be the same message for the community as well, getting our clinical leads and our senior managers engaged in the community services as well. So um, and that will be the focus of our work next year is kind of uh, rolling out that model. But also um, what's impressed me as well with Sligo is that they have a clinical lead now who is an ED consultant. And I know there are some other hospitals now who have identified clinical leads as well. And that is really the way forward um, for open disclosure, I think, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. Maybe just feeding into that, um, not uh, just another question there was about whether um, this is being taught um, for, I suppose, training medical students and nursing students? Uh, that's one of the questions, Angela, coming in there. The yes, so, on the um, so we have written to all of the um, postgraduate training bodies and the undergraduate and postgraduate training bodies to identify if open disclosure is included in the training for, you know, uh, doctors, nurses, midwives, all healthcare professionals. And um, I think we've we wrote to 36 schools and I think 32 came back to us. Well, they all came back to us actually, but 32 came back saying that open disclosure was embedded not only in the undergraduate programs, but also in, in many other postgraduate programs. And for the four schools who had said it wasn't, I mean, all, all, all the medical schools have open disclosure included. Um, and all the nursing schools. So really for those who hadn't, they gave us assurance that it would be included in their curriculum going forward. So for the next semester, they would be have it there. So, and I think that's a very good question because when, when we speak to people in the system, they say, well, we come out of medical school, we come out of nursing school and we're not prepared for this at all. It's, we're not trained on this. So, um, you know, getting this included in these curriculums will be really vital going forward. And we've had great engagement and, we wrote to the college, we give them access to all of our materials as well. And they do many of them link people into our lead learning modules as well now. So that's that's great. We also do a lot of work with the National Doctors Training Program and all NCHDs now, they have a system that they use called the DIME system. This is the Doctors Integrated Management ePortal and the National Employment Record. And on their system now, they have a mandatory space for open disclosure um, where doctors now have to upload evidence of open disclosure training and provide that evidence when they move around in the system through the medical manpower department, provide that evidence of training um, whenever they've, they've moved to a new service. So again, that's a really significant move forward as well. Mm -hmm. And the, through the Intern Network Executive of Ireland as well, um, they have also now um, instilled mandatory training for all interns, um, and that's through the NCHD um, platform on HTC land. And I'd like to acknowledge HC Land as well for the work that they've done in promoting open disclosure and this week as well for a lot of the work that you know they've they've a news item and they've put open disclosure on the carousel of information. And um, when you log into HC Land now, mandatory training comes up straight away and it, it tells you where you are in relation to compliance. So again, all of these things really help with um yeah, thanks, Angela. I'm mindful you'd nearly need to catch your breath, but there's just one yeah. other question, um, and I'm, I'm rather than maybe putting it to the other people. Um, if a patient's incapacitated, who decides who the relevant person is? Is a question that's come in. Does anybody else want to take that, Emma? Do you want to have a go at it, or do you want me to? I'll leave it to you, Angela. I think. Okay, so if a patient is incapacitated, I suppose in relation to open disclosure, the policy is very clear that all patients whose uh, decision making capacity is called into question have a right to open disclosure on an equal basis to, to any other patient or, or service user. So that's the first thing to decide as to um, what level of capacity that patient has. Um, how do they communicate and um, that they are involved in that communication process. 
them as far as reasonably practical and that we have um, an obligation to those service users to to include them to involve them use whatever support needs that they have um, you know it's communication support needs or whatever it is that using all of those um supports to um to engage with them and to try to establish what it is that their their decisions are and who they want involved etc in relation to um, a patient where there's no capacity, you, you would probably refer back to the, the clinical, to the record of, of who is most involved in that patient's care, maybe looking at previous directions given by that patient or service user in relation to the sharing of their information. Um, and if, as I say, where there's no capacity whatsoever, it's going back to who is the, who's the, the, the nearest or closest person um, identified to that individual. So again, it'd be um you would make these decisions on a one-to-one -one basis, and you certainly have, have senior clinicians involved in making that decision. So the way the most responsible person involved in the care of the patient would make that decision where there was no capacity. But really, we'd be expecting that all patients whose capacity has been called into question would be entitled to be involved in that um, pro um, process um, and to be, be provided with the supports that they require to do that. Thank you, Angela. I mean, I, I suppose that's uh, some of the comments came in. They were privately responded to and other people. Um, I know Lorraine had responded to someone as well who had a query about the KPI. So thank you for that, Lorraine. Um, so, yeah, I mean, overwhelming. The, the comments are just thank you very much to, to everyone, but Bernie in particular uh, for her for her presentation. So I think that's the that's all of the questions and comments at the moment, um, Angela. Okay, so I'll just pass you back to Lorraine now. She, I don't know if Lorraine wants to come in there. Um. Well, I, I suppose just echo what M Mary and Angela have said. It was really encouraging to see all the local work that has been undertaken. And um, there's some really fantastic local ideas that uh, uh, this has been an excellent platform to share that on. Um, and it's always very heartwarming to hear from Bernie. And I think that's what drives all of us is to drive that, um, you know, uh, patient safety for the patients. And I think for any clinicians, whoever is actually involved in those open disclosure meetings, it's meeting the patients and their relevant persons face to face that really drives them and engages them then in actually doing the supporting the incident review and implementing learning and improving. So it's absolutely key. So um, a fantastic webinar again for me. Uh, thanks a million, Angela, for, for hosting it and all the organisation in the background. Thank you. And we've been fortunate today. We haven't, as dare I say it, had any IT problems in uh, like no, our previous just... webinars. So um, that, that we're really grateful for that today. So, I mean, personally, I'd just like to acknowledge all of our speakers today, because without our leads um, across the country, you know, the implementation would be very difficult. Our leads and our trainers and all of the managers and staff who engage with us, but also to acknowledge greatly to the patients, Patient Safety Ireland, Bernie, um, our independent patient rep as well. I don't know whether people have been on Twitter and they've seen Lorraine Riley's story on Twitter um, on Monday, and she really, if, if people would just read that and listen to Bernie's story for this themed week, you know, the, there's just such strong message in there around the importance of open disclosure. So, and um, we've got tips prayer on online today, today from patients to patients of Gerard as well, and also our patient advocacy services, but also to acknowledge all of the, the services across the country and all of our external stakeholders who support us and all of our colleagues in the quality and patient safety director, Dr. Orla Healy and um, Lorraine as well, who's been with us for every webinar, Lorraine, since you joined us. So that, that's great. And, and I'd also like to acknowledge my own team, who are just um, a an absolute pleasure to work with. And um, you know, nothing is ever too much an, an, of an ask for them. So I feel really hugely um, you know, lucky to work in the, the Open Disclosure team and the incident management team, the wider team. So um, thank you all for that. So just really, um, just to to again bring us back to the focus of our themed week this week. So just if you're online today, you know what are you doing to promote open disclosure in your service? Um, you know there is our newsletter there. Page two of the newsletter is really a very uh, one page document you can use in team handovers where you can update staff on open disclosure and their responsibilities and where they can find more information. And um, whatever you can do to um, promote open disclosure this week and every week going forward um, uh, and making sure the staff are up to date with their mandatory training. We have seen a, a huge increase in training in quarter three of this year, which we're delighted about. 
So just to remind everybody that for every member of staff, um, e-learning module one is the mandatory module. For staff who have to engage in um, formal open disclosures as part of their role, then they must complete e-learning module two and also attend a face-to-face -face skills programs. That's really your, your doctors, your managers, your senior nurses, senior uh, healthcare professionals, and your, your QPS staff, patient liaison staff, complaints officers, all should be completing learn, uh, e learning module two and attend a face-to-face -face program. And to uh, access face-to-face -face training, just contact the lead for your area and you can um, find out details on the leads on our website as well. Just moving on there and um, just to also advertise as part of the wider quality and patient safety directorate, of which our team is part of the next QI talk time webinar is on the 22nd of November from one to two. And really, this is going to be very interesting. There's a number of QI stories from the postgraduate certificate in quality improvement, leadership and healthcare. So if you go on to the, um, the website there, you can link in for information on that webinar and for future uh, webinars from the QI talk time team. And just to say that uh, this is our last webinar for, for this year. We hope to uh, restart our webinars in January or February next year. So um, if you have any suggestions for further webinars, we will be repeating some of our webinars that we ran this year, particularly the ones around the staff support and the communication. Um, and we're we're hoping, hopefully now putting in our plan for webinars for next year. If you have any suggestions, please um, email them to us. There will be an evaluation, as I said, there is CPD for today, but part of the CPD process requires that um, you evaluate the webinar and we do get as we, we are actually audited on this. So you will receive an email with a short survey, take about two minutes to, to complete and do be honest in your evaluations and do give us um, ideas for what you'd like to see coming down the line that will assist you in implementing open disclosure. So just to say um, thank you all for your attendance today. Great attendance again and uh, wishing you all a good day and keep the open, open disclosure message going this week. And thank you all. If our panel